Welcome to the golden age of cameras where I've used the Sony a7 IV for over a year now and it is the best hybrid camera, the best value camera for this price range. And we are going to get into many more hot takes other than that very shortly. But very quickly, I am a content creator slash filmmaker. I've filmed weddings, I've done a lot of short form media, filmed a bunch of different things in different settings at different professional settings, but I haven't filmed things like commercials or full big budget things. And this camera is the best camera I've used and I've shot everything on my Sony a7 IV. That includes what's on my channel, what's on my Instagram and everything else. So with that note, let's jump into the photo capabilities of this camera. So right off the bat, this camera is amazing when it comes to taking photos. The 33 megapixel sensor gives you so much room to crop. The dynamic range is amazing. And honestly, you cannot go wrong with this as your photo camera. That being said for photos, basically every camera since I don't know, Canon 70D could take you good photos, so that's not too surprising. But at the same time, there's nothing you could really want more. The crop modes work great on video and photo mode. It turns my 24mm to a 36mm with just a press of a button, which is really handy. It's kind of as if you're using an APS-C camera, not a full frame camera when you use that mode, but it's definitely worth it in a pinch. The only potential drawback is if you are someone filming some fast action sports, some wildlife photography, you can only shoot 10 photos per second and mechanical or electronic shutter, which is a bit slow when you compare to some of these crazy cameras that are coming out. 30 shots per second, that's ridiculous. So you definitely know who you are if you need faster shooting. So overall, I've put a bunch of photos on the screen, but every camera these days can do amazing photos, especially the Sony a7 IV with that 33 megapixel size. I think that's the perfect amount. Any more and then your files are just ridiculously large. Any less and you do miss out on a little bit of cropping, which is always a bit nice having that 33 megapixels. It's definitely been a welcome addition since moving from the Lumix S5 back in the day, which is only about like a 24 megapixel camera. Now let's talk about video capabilities, and this is what I use the most. In terms of picture formats, you have the s tone, but I've established that in the past, it's not very good. If you want to shoot video on this camera, you need to shoot S-Log3, and when you do, my goodness, the results are amazing. The 10-bit 422 file formats on 4K30, 4K60, and the improved sensor from predecessors are just amazing. You don't need to overexpose your S-Log3 by two stops. You honestly have quite a lot of flexibility when it comes to exposure so even if you screw up your shot a little bit and you don't get the right exposure, you can easily recover it. Obviously, that's not the most ideal situation, but it still is good enough to handle this type of user error. The low light performance on the a 7 IV is also very, very capable and honestly very good. It definitely compares to the Lumix S5 II. And I've showed some examples in the past with the original Lumix S5 and it does perfectly fine, even considering the 33 megapixel sensor. Gerald Undone measured the dynamic range to be on par, if not better than the Sony a 7 S3. And that is a full-fledged video camera so the fact that this comes along and gives you better dynamic range is ridiculous for a much cheaper price as well so overall from all the footage I've put on the screen you can tell that it looks amazing dynamic range really harsh lighting you can recover a lot of information and it just looks stunning in my opinion so just some few little drawbacks I think 1080 120 frames per second could be a bit better the LCD screen really struggles in the Sun unfortunately I was filming a wedding in the bright daylight using the LCD screen because I was running mobile on a gimbal and it was really hard to see. We still got the job done, barely, but it was very difficult and definitely a challenge. That is a bit tough because I feel like one of the only screens you can see in broad bright daylight is an iPhone 14 Pro and you know how hard Apple goes with their screens so you can't expect that much from an LCD screen on the camera which is why you should buy an external monitor which is my bad. And it also would be nice to be able to do things like load your own LUTs onto the camera and also have a false color on the camera but I think I'm asking for too much. That's more for the cinema camera line and already you can do amazing stuff without these features. It's got enough in there. The S-Log3 assist is great and it can really just help you shoot S-Log if you have no idea what you're doing. So it's basically great for any skill level and even for pros and we'll get into if it's pro enough later in the video. Let's quickly talk about 4K60 crop. Does it affect me? Honestly, sometimes, but mostly it's perfectly fine. It does give you some more reach when you need some more reach on your lens, which is great. But for example, filming that wedding, it would have been nice to have that 4K 60 on your full frame of your camera so you can get that beautiful bokeh. Basically, it would just make your shot look better if it wasn't cropped. But what can you do? I still think it turned out very well. So overall, the 4K coming from the downsampled 7K image is just beautiful and really emphasizes why we are in the golden age of cameras because this is really accessible and and it can produce amazing results. Let's quickly talk about IBIS and stability of the camera. Kind of my dream is to just have a camera, shoot it handheld, takes a few steps, and not have an earthquake or footage. 
and honestly this camera really does the job. I will admit it is a bit challenging at times dealing with the stabilization because the IBIS is not the greatest compared to other options out there but there are always trade-offs for that. So for example the IBIS is a bit weaker on this camera but if you use a very wide angle lens beyond 24 mils you're not going to get those IBIS wobbles which are basically ruining your footage and you can't save that at all. You also have the backup of callous brow so if you really screw up your footage and you need to stabilize it that's a good last line of defense. I wouldn't do it for all my clips because it's just so much workflow and it's not really worth it. I also think if you don't pay the footage comes out as 8-bit not 10-bit which is a bit of a shame. If you're very careful you ninja walk really well with active stabilization and honestly it looks like you are shooting on a gimbal however every slight shake there's a slight kind of like camera shift and it's very noticeable in the video. Unfortunately electronic stabilization for example warp stabilizer does not deal with that very well so that can kind of ruin the footage. However DaVinci Resolve stabilization does work a little bit better with this type of like shift hiccups you'll see examples of this here. So like I mentioned with some challenges you can still get some beautiful results just handheld and 95% of the things I've shot are handheld so I would give it the tick of approval but something like the Sony a7R5 stabilization would help me tremendously which might be coming along soon hopefully. Now let's talk about overheating and this is when I am going to start ranting because this thing does not overheat. Stop using this for your YouTube thumbnails it does not overheat. I shot all day like 10 hours with this camera shooting 4k 60, 4k 30, 422 and it held up perfectly fine. The camera was getting a bit hot but if you change the auto temp control setting on the camera to high I'm not sure about writing to both SD cards because I'm just a bit concerned didn't want to risk anything but from my experience writing to one SD card doing that setting makes it perfectly fine and when I was filming this video it was like 85 degrees. It was not a cool day. For some more context I literally ran my battery down from 100% to 30% in just one session shooting this wedding so there's nothing you should worry about. So that kind of lends itself to the discussion is it pro enough and all the pro filmmakers basically shoot on this camera because it's not reliable. Honestly it's been extremely reliable to me. If you're shooting things that are that high stakes you're always going to have a B camera anyway so you could just have another Sony a7 IV and if this overheats just switch it out. But other than overheating this camera produces video that is basically on par if not better to the Sony a7S III so it is definitely pro enough in this circumstance. If you're a bit shy holding a mirrorless camera when you're doing a professional gig just rig it out you'll look very pro in no time. So if you're going to get this camera do not worry about how pro it is. The video it produces is amazing for any Sony camera so relax you can definitely film some amazing stuff with this. In addition basically due to how Sony makes its cameras it doesn't really offer firmware updates a lot so having this camera it's fairly new it has many updates that are very beneficial compared to older cameras even the a7s3 for example the focus breathing compensation so now comparing the Sony a7 IV to current competitors the biggest competitor is definitely the Lumix S5 II I think objectively on paper the Lumix S5 II has better specs than the Sony a7 IV because it can shoot 6k in a taller format which would actually benefit me because I love shooting vertical video. It also has countless video centric features. However, there's one thing it doesn't have and that is the beloved E-mount. Long story short, the E-mount has the widest selection of camera lenses that you can buy and basically there's a lens for every purpose you could possibly think of. And just for a quick comparison, my current lens that I'm filming on right now is a 24G Master and if I went to Lumix and bought the L-mount Sigma f1.4 lens, that lens is about 560 grams, this one's about 480. The form factor is worse. Also because it's a Sigma lens it won't even focus as well compared to the stock Lumix lenses and honestly just from this reason alone I do not want to leave my beloved 24mm f1.4 G Masters. Now diving into the price of these lenses because there is no secondhand market for these L mount lenses well it's very small compared to the E mount you can't get as good of a deal as all these cheap Tamron lenses that show up secondhand or any lens that Sony is secondhand. And just for a quick example I bought a 24-70 Sigma L mount lens and it depends appreciate so much when I tried to sell to L mount because basically no one would buy it because no one really uses L mount. It's just easier to use a camera system where there are more people, it's more popular and the more services for you. And now don't get me started on Canon. The RF mount is just a train wreck. It costs so much money. You can't use the old lenses. It's just a big waste of money in my opinion for something that you could just buy for example a Sony or even a Lumix camera is better than the Canon options. And for Nikon the video features aren't really good at all unless you splurge even more dollars. So 
that's why we don't talk about those companies. So lastly, is this camera worth buying in 2023? Honestly, yes. However, I would suggest that you wait just a little bit because there are rumors of the A93, which may have 4K60 uncropped, may have some ridiculously new features that are very worth it. And if you're interested in secondhand market, then people will probably sell their A74s in no time for that. But again, these are just rumors, so you don't know what's true. If you are in doubt or if you are on the fence, you should definitely buy this camera because you can just produce amazing content, amazing results. If you watched the video before, after all this use of this camera, I'm honestly over the moon because it's helped me as a filmmaker so much and it's just crazy how good these cameras can get. For about 3K Australian dollars, that's like the same price as a body of the Lumix S5 II. And when you compare lens prices, Lumix lenses are very expensive. So this can even be more affordable than a Lumix counterpart. That's if you do not buy G Masters because G Masters are obviously very expensive. So overall, as someone who's been using Lumix GH5 S5 for a long time and then jump into the Sony, it's just so welcome having an ecosystem, a family to just easily use, use all these amazing lenses and it's been well worth it. I'm definitely a little bit FOMO about that 6K taller video because I love shooting vertical videos, but it's not worth giving up the E-mount and everything that comes with Sony. This camera is definitely worth buying and if you enjoyed, leave a like and I'll catch you in the next one.